I do believe in all we have is the present moment. I do think that it's nice to have objectives because it gives us a, a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling to do something because you think that in the future, this will lead to something else good or it'll make someone else happy. But I do really fundamentally believe in the present moment and enjoying it, not wanting to be elsewhere. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel in these encounters with this uh, beautiful and inspiring minds. Please like and subscribe uh, so that you too can become part of this process of, you know, getting closer and closer to the truth, getting closer and closer to what matters and to the realization of uh, our true nature, who, who, who we really are. And also if you have something to say and they want to share it here and discuss and have a talk with me, please contact me and let's talk. And today my guest is Sab, and this is a name that he chose for himself, right? Sab, welcome Ta -da, to my show. Thank you for accepting my invite. My pleasure. I was going to say, yeah, you, you mentioned my name. In fact, I came to France more than half a lifetime ago from the UK. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was half running away from things I wasn't enjoying and half running towards a sort of imagined something I would enjoy more. But uh, without going into that, because that's another story, I thought I'm changing my country, my language, my friends, my job. Did I say language? Yes. Why not change my name as well? You know, I mean, not change it. It's, I don't, I'm not embarrassed about the, the first name my parents gave me. It's still on my passport. But I thought, isn't it a funny concept that we lay, I'm into labels, or rather I'm into spotting labels and seeing if people are really happy with those labels. Um, and a name is kind of a label. And we take it on before we've even, we even realize it's been applied. Um, people call us that. It's the first thing they say. It's probably the first thing. And we associate that label, whatever that name happens to be, that kind of random name. And I thought, isn't it funny that we, we carry that with us for all of our lives? And sometimes we end up defining out there was a good example. I think it was, was it a Karen or something like that in the States? <laughs> Karen became a sure. whole set of <laughs> characteristics. I, I had fun deciding that I was going to tell people that I was going to be called another name, not my original one. I don't live in Paris, although I sold my soul, my creative passion um, to Paris. Paris is my creative uh, inspiration. Lady Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower is my symbolic muse. But I don't live in Paris, just for practical reasons, because it's very expensive. expensive so yes. I've got more space here. And it's really nice to just go out and walk in a field, you know, walk in the woods as opposed to walk down a, a busy boulevard. But yeah. I've got a direct line into Paris because I need one. I have to. It's my lifeline. Do you mind if I uh, read one of your poems already? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. And this is a surprise, folks. I have no idea what she's going to read. I've thrown rainbows at the sky. They landed in puddles, so I splashed. I've known goddesses, Greek and Gallic lost my religion when they clashed. I've zipped from myriad murky seas, slipped and fell, almost drowned. I've siphoned silent symphonies and lurching lullabies, endless sound. I've tasted seven types of tyranny, indulged others' dreams. Mine were stabbed. I've studied pyramids of old Euclid, applied brave systems unabashed. I've offered up my very soul. Thought savage tribes stood my ground. I've populated planet Earth. Now come inside, see what I found. And this is called internal workings of an abstract mind. <laughs> How does it feel when I read your own poem? Crazy. I cannot remember writing that. Really? Yeah, but I mean, I write a lot. Um, and time yeah. goes and time goes. You know what happens <clears throat> when I create something? Mm. It's like a mini, a mini, it's like a child, but on a very compressed scale. So I could have an idea. I'll make it on the smallest compressed scale possible. I'll have an idea in the morning. I'll bring it into being. It could be a text or it could be a photograph. And then I'll let it go, let it fly. 
into the universe, which is it's not quite as uh, romantic as it sounds. I basically pay, publish it on Facebook. Yes. And it's gone. It's flying on its own wings. I don't know what's going to happen to it. I don't know if people, some will like it, some won't like it, but it's gone. And then I move on to the next thing. And it's a bit like that poem. I literally can't remember writing. I couldn't tell you the year. But it touched me. And this is another funny thing. I think you can get touched by your own pieces. That's, there are so many people. Take it for exa example, could be poetry or it could be photography. Yeah. So many people are embarrassed to admit they like their own creations. They make every single excuse. They criticize them before even showing it to you. They say, this is crap, but here it is with the kind of, you know, oh, my God, I, I'm so bad. Wow. This is this is this is terrible. So, so uh, it, was, it was very, very strange to hear that. I believe you that I wrote those words and I heard hints of my my past life in there. I can imagine what I was where I was kind of in my life. Because I read quite a few. Well, about 15 poems of yours last mm, night. Thank and you. Mm. Yeah, I know. It's very I love them. I love poetry. Mm. And uh, to me, for some reason, I got glued to this one because I always follow my intuition. I follow my vibe. So when I it vibrates, I stick to it. And somehow to me was an invitation to your world. You said that you spend half of your time creating and half of your time helping others uh, to be as creative as they would love to be. Right? And that the, the creative act of bringing new things into being and sharing them is actually the most spiritual thing that you know. And uh, that you express yourself daily through photography, articles, poetry, and painting. And I will share in the comment section below all the links, or at least some, <laughs> because he has quite a few. It's a, it's a forest there. You can get lost so that you can explore um, some of his work. It's really worth taking the time to look through this Amazing mix of images and words and color and, and shots. And, and it's, it really takes you somewhere else. Well, you have to experience for yourself. And your current project is Transformational Paris Retreats, using the city as a powerful metaphor. Ah, that's that. cool. So what would be the metaphor of Paris? This is, although I've, I've done... Um workshops creative workshops and things in paris before this is a new thing and i'm afraid it's waiting until uh, travel things get better until i bring it into being as mm -hmm. i want to the yeah. idea is to use paris as a kind of um, a metaphorical backdrop to well i've got a few a few planned a couple are based on real skills that i have some experience in like writing and photography but i've got one the one which is probably the most exciting is a transformational retreat in paris so people come for about five days we spend five days together mm -hmm. they can spend a week in paris they can add on a bit of holiday if they want but it's five powerful days where i take them through a journey it's it's aimed at people who if i took one person it could be for many people but if i take a typical person i imagine doing it it's someone who they've got to a certain stage in their life where they seem to have everything they thought would make them happy um maybe a few of us have been through that including me and uh, you know you've got the job maybe the the partner the family the, the kids uh, the car the house etc um and then you're kind of you know you get to that point where you think uh but what about me or is that it or i thought there was more or yeah oh my god i used to love you know i go to art exhibitions you know what i used to love scribbling as a kid i used to love it i used to fill my school books with beautiful little doodles on the edge what happened to that little boy what happened to that little girl you know who liked yeah. playing with animals or etc so there comes a point in some people's lives where they start to remember that and regret i don't want people to regret what they've done in their lives at any point but that doesn't mean you can't you have to stay where you are if you're not mm -hmm. you know, if you've got you've got these questions starting to come so I imagine a series of metaphors which I lead people through over the five days in a group of people in a similar situation. Um, and uh, so, yeah, each, each morning, each afternoon, we'll do something in Paris, which will take them from a journey from this questioning, knowing there's more, but not quite sure what it is or how to get there, how to move on. By the end, not having all their problems solved or anything, but having a clear path forward if they choose to take it. 
And how exactly will you use Paris? Will you visit sites in Paris? Will you take uh, photographs? Or you haven't thought of that yet? I tend to, I tend to think of things when I need to. Okay. So I know the idea is, the potential is there. Yes. I know that when people, when I've brought people on it, the ideas will appear. Um, so the point I'm at now, all I need now is a few examples for a few of these sessions. And I don't want people to think, by the way, I kind of said, I said I sold my creative soul to Paris. And people often ask me about this. They say, why Paris? And I get the feeling they think that I think Paris is the best place to be. You know, lucky me, poor you, you don't live in Paris. That's not it at all. I want everybody to find their own Paris. I found Paris. It happened to be a pretty impressive place, but it could be anywhere. You don't have to come to Paris. That's got nothing to do with it. It's about finding a place you feel good. And sometimes you have to take a, go on a journey to come back to that place. And that's one of my metaphors, actually. It's, it's a bit of a secret. It's a favorite metaphor of mine that I'm going to use, but I'll tell you anyway. <clears throat> In Paris, so this will be a session, a morning session or an afternoon session. Mm -hmm. And in Paris, there's a, there are two metro lines in Paris. I mean, there's more, but there are two in particular. One goes around the top of Paris, around the north. Yes. And another one goes around the south. So it actually, it's like this, it makes a loop. Yes. But people don't necessarily know this. So in this metaphor, I will, we'll meet up in a cafe in the morning, have a coffee. Of course, it's Paris, you know. <laughs> Let's get our priorities Yeah, right. the croissant coffee and, and the coffee, yes. <laughs> coffee and croissant first. Then we get on a train. We get on the train, and they don't know what train we're getting on. It happens to be a line which, although it's the underground, you know, subway, the metro, these two lines actually have qu quite a lot of elevated parts above the city, going along the middle of the boulevards. <clears throat> so not only do you see, you look down, you see there's graffiti on the, there's all sorts of things. So they get on, we go on the trip, we look out mm -hmm. the window and maybe give them a couple of exercises. We might get off in certain quarters and do a little exercise, uh, like a you know a transformational or an inquiring exercise together. You go through different quarters on this, this line. There are some rich quarters and there are some poorer quarters. <clears throat> you might be looking out on beautiful like bourgeois apartments one moment. A bit yeah. further down the line, you might be seeing guys selling, you know, fake cigarettes or, or worse in the street. Watches. You go, yeah, you go through it all. And the, you go over the canals, you go over the Seine, you see the Eiffel Tower, all oh. sorts of possibilities mm. for, um, for enjoying this trip. Then we get off. Then we get on another train. They don't know what train it is. We carry on. We do some more stuff. Then we get off. We get on another train. We carry on. And then we get off. And then we go to a cafe to talk about our experiences. Mm -hmm. After this big trip, having, you know, lived various experiences, um, discovered things together and so on. But we're back in the same cafe that we left at. We've actually, they don't know, or maybe they might start to realize they've done a circle around Paris, but they've come back to the point of departure and the oh. same cafe. You know, it's that obvious. It's the same seats, maybe. And yet they're transformed. Something has changed. They've lived quite a few, you know, experiences um, of various types. And then we can discuss that. And the sort of, you know, bam, here comes the metaphor in life. Sometimes you need to travel in order to realize that home was, was actually with you all the time. Um, and that it, but sometimes you do need to travel to discover that. So that's, that's an example of a, a little metaphor. And then it's that. up to people to decide what they want to take from that. I see. And what is for you, because we've been talking about transformation and uh, I want to get into the coaching that you do in a moment, but what is transformation to you then? I mean, when you use this word, what is the experience behind it for you? It's kind of a buzzword at the moment, to be honest. Yeah. Transformational coaching, uh, et cetera. What is a transformation? Yeah, I yeah because we all, we all, in coaching, we all talk about that, to transform. What do we transform into? What do we transform? And why do we want to transform all the time? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's a word. It's a buzzword. It sounds really cool. Um, sounds and then cool, you've got, yeah. you've got metaphors like, you know, the caterpillar pillar turning into the butterfly and all that yeah. sort of stuff, which mm -hmm. is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if, if those metaphors help people, great. Mm -hmm. um, but are we really transforming, to be honest, or are we simply getting happier with 
how we are now. And how we are now, yeah. What what happened to you then? Do you think you have transformed along the years? That's a big question. Into... What happened to you? <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> how much have you transformed? Well, we have to question the word, whether it's the right word, as mm-hmm. I was I was suggesting. Mm-hmm. It's a cool word, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily the right word because we are we are <clears throat> we are who we are at the core. So it's not as though we're going to transform into a completely different entity. We are us. That's that's always there. I think it's more a case of being happier with with ourselves. So transforming into someone who you can transform into someone, I guess, who is has more of a di- clear direction in life. They, someone who is more at uh, peace with themselves. So yeah, maybe you know. I mean, transformation. It's probably thinking about it. It's probably not quite the word it's more of a more of a sort of a mental spiritual transformation that people perceive Mm -hmm. they they might look back on their life and say wow I used to be so shy I didn't dare to um to create anything let alone show it to anyone else and now look at me now I can speak in public so basically it's becoming more of your potential becoming more of yourself that's what's transforming, like the caterpillar, right? That transforms into a butterfly. That's you... a nice way of looking at it, yeah. I, I mean, it's not for me to, to, to tell someone else what their transformation should be, you know. Some people, they don't want to create stuff. Oh, for sure, not, not for other people. No. But I was wondering for you, if you look at your own life now, mm-hmm. how would you describe the transformation that you've been through? Uh, interesting question. And I, I honestly don't think... I've transformed. I think I've just evolved. You've evolved. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. I've built up, as everyone, I've built up experiences in life, happy experiences, sad experiences, maybe mm-hmm. tragic, maybe stupid, maybe wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this builds me as a person. And um, yeah, and over the, I've always been a thoughtful person. I've always enjoyed creating things on a, a small scale. I, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this quite a lot. Before talking to you, Suzanne, I was thinking about um, people who talk about spiritual journeys. <clears throat> Some people, they say, I'm on a spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. And um, it sounds pretty cool. For a start, spiritual is kind of difficult to define. And secondly, why can't everybody be on a spiritual journey? I, I suspect, I, I have a, a little feeling Mm -hmm. saying that you're on a spiritual journey there's a certain type of spiritual one-upmanship like i'm i'm more spiritual i'm more spiritual than you are sort of thing this is my my kind of cynical side coming in but i don't want anybody to have like a a monopoly on spirituality spirituality i don't really but nobody has and uh yeah maybe there are a few that claim that but i don't think anybody has spirituality for me is more like focusing on on that eternal part of you and that which is non-material and that which is deep down there if you look at it, uh, as opposed to the material where you just want to become a millionaire and you want to, you know, uh, have a big house and uh, this is all that matters in the barbecue uh, uh, weekend. (laughs) So to me, this is like, it's not, of course, we're all spiritual in the sense that uh, somehow at a certain point, consciously or unconsciously, we're all looking for something deep down like some answers and that connection, that fluidity that you, I can't wait to explore with you, how you, how you get connected to whatever you define as a source uh, when you create. But uh, not everybody is able to, to do it uh, in a conscious way. So to me, this is what spirituality, when consciously you are taking steps towards that. Like I, I meditate every day, not to reach anywhere, but because it helps me look within and connect with that which matters to me, as opposed to just, you know, uh, buying nicer shoes, for instance. <laughs> well, that, that sounds like a, a perfect uh, definition of spirituality, if we have to. It's another label, you know, all words are labels, trying to describe something else. Yeah, yeah, we um, had that conversation last time. Yeah, about labels. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, um, I, just want to, I just want to see everybody. Not even everybody, not everyone even wants to explore. Some people don't ask themselves exactly, the questions. Exactly. They're yes. perfectly happy watching Netflix every evening, as I am sometimes. Yes. But some people don't ask any big questions. And if they're okay with that, it's definitely not for me to tell them they shouldn't be. You know. You told me that you offer individual coaching and uh, these nine-week master classes on photography, writing, and creativity itself. Yes. 
as well as on the history and curiosity of Paris. So this is awesome. This is coming. And this is just in brackets, creating stuff along the lines of someone who, you know, creates pottery or paints, as opposed to just talking about spirituality and, and transformation all the time. I love, I'm always impressed by people who do things that I would like to know how to do, or I that see. I can just appreciate. So mm -hmm. I love people who are in action, who are creating, basically. Yeah. So Paris, photography, and so on. It sounds like a little bit like I've chosen a small thing. It's like choosing to be a, a tennis player. So you spend a huge amount of your life hitting a ball. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't there more to life than that? I appreciate diversity in somebody's life. And I also appreciate somebody who's focused on one thing. And I admire both because uh, it's just life expressing through, uh, through each of us in a unique way. And this is what I like about you, that you are, even though you don't like those words, and even though you try to get out of those labels as much as you can, from what I've perceived, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you are in deeply into spirituality anyway, but through the direct experience, because creation is spirituality. So, you know, this is a, a way to get in touch with the source. The moment you create, you are it with a capital I. So, uh, so please talk to me a little bit about the coaching uh, because this is an important uh, uh, subject for me. I want our viewers to understand what you're doing. I'm looking here uh, at your website. Have you changed it recently? No, no the laser coaching. I don't think so. No, okay. Well, I've got two, the, two, two ways of coaching with me very okay. briefly. One is... Um, individual I, sessions. I guess traditional individual sessions, packages over, over I don't know, four months, eight months, a year. Mm -hmm. But a new thing is laser coaching. It's another system I'm trying just for fun mm -hmm. to see if that's different. Yeah. Yeah. You said that it's simple, focused, and effective. And reading through it, I saw that you are offering this 30-minute initial like conversation, and then there are 15-minute sessions. What, what do you do in 15 minutes? I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's a new thing I'm trying. And yeah. so far, it's cool, but it's not for everybody, as they say. It's not like you turn up for your weekly session, you know, whatever. It's a completely different way of looking at coaching. And it's for people, it's specifically for people who want precise results quickly. And it's unlimited in that you can book a session at any time. The session, sessions are only 15 minutes long. But you can do an awful lot in 15 minutes, especially when you're working on a focused thing. The only proviso is for booking your next session anytime is that you've yeah. done the homework that we agreed on from the last session. And what words, does that, massive. what would that work be? Is like a, a, a practice that you teach them to do or in terms of creation itself, like doing the, taking well, a photo or drawing or writing a text? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, it's it's for, it's for them to decide what their next step is. Um, so whatever their thing is, and it is for people who want to create. It doesn't have to be typical creation. I mean, traditional creativity like painting. Yeah. It could mm -hmm. be creating a business. It doesn't really matter. Bringing something new into being. That's often a challenge for a lot of people. Um, so basically, for this type of coaching, I want people to come with me, to come to me with a project that they want help with. They want to be accompanied. They want to be motivated. And they want some deadlines. And, um, and at the end of a 15-minute session, it's very structured. Uh, you know, we talk about it. We talk about a challenge that they've got. We work through it. And then at the end of each session, it's, so what are you committing to, um, to do before next time? And the proviso is they have to, they're supposed to do it before they book their next session. And what happens if they don't? Do you punish them? Um. <laughs> Well, it's a kind of mutual agreement, you know, so. Oh, I see. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, but I mean, it's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, they're supposed to do it. So there has to be a bit of, um, you know, me holding the stick in a way. But mm -hmm. it's for their own good, you know. But people will try to get out of what they've committed to. Um, everybody does it. You know, it's, I hate bosses. And the, the boss I hate the most is me. You know, <laughs> my own, I'm my own boss. So. I will set myself a task and then I will hate myself for setting it and do everything I can to get out of it. But then the boss might be annoyed, but yes. I'm the boss and the person who's supposed to be doing it. So mm -hmm. everyone's like that. You know, many people are like that. So I'm the boss, but I'm a friendly boss, but I'm also a, I'm an exciting boss. I try to be an exciting, motivating boss. That's why people <laughs> to yourself. coaches. Well, no, well, to the coaches. That's why people hire coaches 
because yes. they can't they can't manage themselves it's tough they need someone external but on Absolutely. their side as it were yeah exactly exactly or at so least to project way. to project their inner coach into somebody else because it's somehow easier and uh, the interaction is fun sometimes in in your coaching you mentioned simplicity and efficiency uh where do you want to bring your your clients to what place i know that uh, they they decide for themselves but you have a unique touch to the coaching as you were telling me the other day you and everything that happened to you until now makes who you are today so what is the taste that you bring into the coaching to the person where do you think you bring them there's a couple of questions there one is how do you attract people to yourself um and the, the, there's a huge discussion about niches you know finding your niche etc cetera, etc cetera. the people i'm attracted to yes are those who seem to be doing in terms of coaching for example yes are those who seem to have found their own thing they don't seem to be copying anyone they don't have to be incredibly original hugely new new system but i like people who seem to be okay doing what they're doing they don't seem to need to have massive in your face horrible marketing they just impress you with what they do and i i'm attracted to those people and i'm repelled by people who try to convince you through marketing that they're a great coach for example <laughs> but we have to find clients so so my approach has been to i'm i'm looking for people who want to be really creative i see as as my that's my best path that i've found towards spirituality if you like yes as you as you said exactly before susanna what you said creating is a spiritual thing it's as it's maybe it's god maybe it's getting close to god when you create you've created you've brought something into being isn't that what god does so without having sort of um illusions of grandeur you know exactly for sure everybody's their own god as it were you know so i want i want people to feel the joy of creating bringing things into being and it's not a selfish thing because the first thing i want to do is share my creations in case other people will enjoy them and i want them to share theirs with me you know i don't it's not a one way street so basically my approach is to create a lot of stuff enjoy generously and people the people who are drawn to that are probably my people in the way that i'm drawn to people who are doing things with, well by definition if i'm drawn to what they're doing i'm probably their people you know we we find each other exactly you mentioned that in coaching actually you're dealing with people who are somehow frustrated that they haven't gotten as far as they could in the creative aspect of their life um, yes with any sort of expression helping them reignite that flame if you want how so how do you do that and we can do an example i don't know if you have considered that to do a little bit of a of a practice at the end with me <laughs> we can try <laughs> i mean there's no good and bad experience but, right <laughs> we should not be ashamed of what we're doing <laughs> yeah 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 well don't get too excited i'll just probably ask you a few questions and see what happens <laughs> well i want to be you said it should be fun i want to enjoy this <laughs> oh yeah well i don't really do things if they're not fun that's um i'm kind of against that on principle so how do you do that just can you think of an example like of a of a person without of course mentioning their name but you know somebody that you worked with that was experiencing some frustration in their creativity and how you approached it and you know just for us to have an idea of what you're doing for me i have to say <clears throat> creativity is not it's kind of it's another buzzword a bit like spirituality all i want is for people to to lead happy lives live happy and i enjoy lives. when i create things and share them with people i feel happy So that's that's why I I go on about creativity. It just happens to be a my thing and for some other people I think it might be good for other people as well. That might be a a nice way for others to reach happiness. And I've seen it happen often. So um I don't know just random example you know there's many examples. I could even take a kind of amalgam of of all of those people. Yes. It's someone who and but I've got specific people in mind. they 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 have a feeling inside them they could be more creative they're often they don't believe in themselves or they they don't think they're creative and they've often had this sort of label put on them or adopted it without even realizing from an early age so many people say that they're not creative literally those words oh i'm not creative <laughs> uh okay that's uh that's uh that's a shame i i don't believe you but <laughs> 
um, you know, why would you say I'm not creative? We all are. But people have a very set idea of, you know, creativity is art. Good art looks like this. My paintings don't look anything like that. Therefore, I'm not creative and I'm not an artist. And by the way, I never will be because it's too late. So many people have got these, these ideas. And I, in the nicest possible way, destroy those ideas. I have nothing, you know, I, but it's in a very simple way, getting people to create something incredibly simple, you know, like one, take one photograph. Your assignment is to take one photograph, go out there and take a photograph of something that you like, that you, that you find interesting. Mm -hmm. They show the photograph. I say, oh, great, that's wonderful. Why did you, you know, why did you take that photograph? And I said, well, well, I don't know. I just like the way the, the, the window was against the wall, you know, and that little piece of peeling paint. And I say, great. That's absolutely wonderful. It's a beautiful photograph. And thank you for sharing that with us or with me. And um, how do you feel about it? Do you like it? And they'll say, um, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and I say, it's okay to like your own creations. You know, you don't have to be embarrassed about it. So it's making people feel that it's okay to try. <clears throat> I have this thing about the word success. Uh -huh. A lot of people have, have this sort of black and white idea in their minds. Something is either a success or a failure. Um, and normally that is judging the success or failure on somebody else's terms. My definition is if you try, you succeed. And if you don't try, well, we look into why you didn't try. Mm -hmm. you know, forget the F word, <laughs> failure. It's a, it's a terrible <laughs> word, terrible word. You succeed if you try. I'm not saying that you fail if you don't try, but you've, you have to admit you decided not to try, which is up to you. But you definitely succeed if you try. Every time you try, it's like learning a language. You try to speak hesitantly with a horrible accent. You tried, you tried, well done, well done, excellent. You tried. I see. That's it. There's no failure. Every attempt, even, even talking to me, thinking about, tim timidly thinking about maybe I might try painting a little bit, you know, but even that's a success. So many people, it's sad. It's sad to see so many people um, have been so crushed sometimes in life, or they've just fallen into a rut, as I said earlier, you know, to get the house, car, <laughs> husband, wife, divorce. Now there's, now there's something wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, it's not for well, me. We, no, we think of that as well. I mean, me and for the balance. I mean, for me, it's more like in this as it is, how can I? Uh, become more of who I am and how can I let, I was telling you the other day, how can I let myself shine exactly where I am without judging it for good and bad? And, you know, with this house, with this husband, with this family, with these barbecues, what can I add to myself? <laughs> and probably yeah. this is where you come in. So I know I've discussed about this last time and uh, uh, maybe I can get a bit more information this time when I'm asking this question. What is your background and what tools are you using in your coaching? <laughs> I try my luck. I think we had a big discussion about the word tools. <laughs> a few years ago, I've got a story about this, which is quite an interesting one. Please share. I'd looked into various types of coaching, you know, read a few books and stuff. And then I thought I would do an official coaching certificate um, in, for here in France of the type that is recognized officially so that companies who want employees to have a coach will pay for it. I did the train, the in-person training for a few days or a couple of weeks together intensively. Then you coach people over the next few months. You are coached yourself. And you have to write this huge, <laughs> awful thing about your coaching experience. And I got I started getting a bit stuck with that. You know, I'm a bit lazy fundamentally. I like to you know, take the easy, easy path if possible. And that was a bit of a chore for me. You know, I felt more and more that they wanted me to write what they wanted to hear. And I encourage independent thinking, mm -hmm. not, dis not disrespectful thinking, but independent thinking. And I thought I'm going to have to go in front of a panel of people and basically churn out what they expected me to hear, what they expected to hear. They'd give me a scenario. Someone has a problem with this. How would you approach it? What tools would you use? Sure. Fine. Great. I have no problem with that. Um, and the tools that I learned were interesting, but it was a bit of a drag. And this is where it gets interesting. Oh. I was being coached through, throughout the process. That's one of the things over the months you are coached as a future coach. 
but it got towards the end when I had to turn in this assignment, go in front of the panel and basically tell them what they wanted to hear. And, uh, and she wasn't quite sure where I was going, this coach of mine, young, a young coach. And um, we were sitting in the Galerie Lafayette, looking under the beautiful dome, looking down. It was just a spectacular thing, having a coffee for our coaching session. And at one point she said, she was a bit perplexed and she said, Sab, are you sure you, are you, sure you want to do this qualification? And I said, yeah, of course I do. You know, I paid, paid 5,000 euros. I'll have a nice certificate, which is officially recognized. I'll get more work. Obviously, I want to do it. And then I went away. And I said to myself, that's the best question she has asked me in the entire 12 oh, sessions we've had. Yeah. And, and I realized the answer was no. I didn't want to do it because I didn't want the label. I didn't want to have the same label as every other coach who has done that certificate uh -huh. because it didn't fit me. And at the same time as starting that qualification um, session, I discovered um, another approach, which you could call transformational coaching, if you like, online. So I was doing these two in parallel, a very kind of classic um, path leading towards this certificate, French coaching, which was good, it was fine. But also this like rather more radical transformational coaching through some of the, the big coaches you find online today. And I started thinking, <laughs> I like transformational coaching. I don't want to be, I, I'm taking what I can get from the, the official certificate course. Yes. But to be honest, I'm, I'm somewhere else. I'm somewhere else. For me, for NLP it was great. And we had a, an amazing test at the end after the masterclass where we had to get over the fear of public speaking. And that was the best experience ever in my life. It was mm. terrifying because we had to, to, to keep a speech in front of the public, which were our colleagues, of course, but mm. who had to play the role of the worst audience that you imagine and you're afraid of. And they were good at that. And even though you know that it's a, it's a game and they just play out uh, that, uh, that role, yeah. you are still terrified. And I've been through all type of strange experiences being there in front. First of all, you don't have a subject. You have just to come up with something mm -hmm. to talk about, which was terrifying for me in itself. And then seeing them and they were actually commenting all the time. Oh, my God, she's really, she's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> I was acting, you know. And horrible. everybody else, everybody else before was better than her, you know? So like I'm there and I swear I started crying and they were ignoring me. They were not even looking at me. Oh, you were that really was, crying, really, really crying. Yeah, I really, really cried. Ah, okay. So I really went through everything that I was scared that it was going to happen mm. in front of a, of a negative audience. And at yeah. the end of it, I was healed. I was really transformed. Mm. So for me, it was like a wonderful experience. It really put, put you there, you know, go ahead, girl, and... And, and face those fears and see what yeah. happens. So that's why I was curious, what was your background? For me, NLP helped a lot. They are amazing tools because they're kind of neutral and uh, they apply to everybody. It's basically science. It's how the brain works, how the unconscious works. How can you start talking to your unconscious mind? So it's nothing personal in there. Uh, you don't have to believe, to be a believer, non-believer. There's no labels. It's just the reality of the person because that's all that matters. Your inner representation of the world. And we play with that. So I was wondering if you do the same thing because you told me that <clears throat> you, want, you want to help people get rid of certain labels and also to take them from where they are and bring them to more of themselves. So how do you get there? How do you get in a person's universe? It's really interesting when you mention tools and you mentioned explicitly NLP, there's, there's various, you know, different ways of approaching of things. Yeah. Well, that's my uh, I, background. Yeah. I like the idea of a toolbox. I, I think the most important thing is to have experienced quite a lot of stuff, but you need to develop a certain sensitivity as well. For example, yes. listening. Mm -hmm. um, listening mm -hmm. is it's not exactly a tool, you know, but it's so incredibly important, listening mm -hmm. rather than speaking. Mm -hmm. And silence, you know, listening and silence. But then again, not an uncomfortable silence. You know, there has to be, it has to be, it depends on the person who's opposite you. So it basically comes down to surrendering yourself to what, to where you are with this person. To be honest, we're doing it now, you and I. 
not having expectations, not having a tool in mind, just, you know, I'm, I'm just hovering, I'm just waiting till I can apply the latest tool that I've learned. This is not such a good thing. But if something comes up and you think, wow, you know what, it would be really interesting to do, to do this little activity that I know. Great, that's wonderful. But first and foremost, I think you mentioned it. I, I really try to, to go from my starting point is where they are, not where I am or where I'd like them to be or where I imagine it would be a really a great place for them to be. This mm-hmm. is a disaster. It has to start from where they are. And the only way to know what that is mm. is to ask them questions and to maybe to feel, you know, to get the feel for how they react to certain questions. And that's, that's, that's really a big thing because it's extremely difficult because we, we're coming from us. We are coming from our place. Oh, and often where they are, it's not a comfortable place for us. We might have some you know, preconceived ideas about stuff. And they might say, some, you know, example, bam, out of nowhere. Let's say they take drugs and that's, that's a challenge for them. And let's say I'm anti-drugs. I might have a problem with that because I might be judging them. I might be thinking that they're not a very good person, that I'm better than them because I don't take drugs or, you know, or I did, but I got out of it and they haven't got out yet. You know, it's really tough to honestly and transparently put yourself, try to put yourself where they are. You can never do it 100%. But if you don't, you're not going to help them. You know, you've got to accompany how do you, them. How do you it. do it? Yeah, I was just going to say, it's like, it's Sorry. like, it's not pulling them out. It's being next to them with your hand on their shoulder, walking forwards with them. How, how do you get there? And uh, how would you describe your sensitivity that you have developed through coaching in regards to others and being their support. Because you're somehow you create, from what I perceive in what in the words that you're using, you're creating a space for them where they feel safe and there is some listening happening where they can actually explore more of themselves. That's all you do. This neutral, neutral observer creating a space. Come in this space and create. How do you perceive people? What's that sensitivity that you have developed? I, I see coaching, it's, it's kind of uh, simplistic, but therapy is taking people from a bad place to kind of neutral. Yes. Whereas coaching could be seen as the opposite. It's taking them from a neutral place to something they feel is a, a higher place. Mm-hmm. So it's not so much about helping people with problems. It's helping people with potential. I mean, with their potential. Although we often... Um, come across their problems as well the things that are stopping them from reaching their potential you know yeah so taking them from zero towards 10 as opposed to take dragging them back from minus 10 to to zero that's why i i could have i could have gone down the route of helping people with addictions for example yes but for some and i thought i almost did i thought that would be quite good but then i thought well to be honest i am so excited by people who are They've got this burning potential inside them and they want to create something, but they can't get it out. Maybe I understand that everybody is sensitive. Everybody has huge potential. Everybody is a little boy or a little girl, Uh um, which has often been crushed um, by all sorts of things. And it's not their fault. Um, And seeing that in the, in the big grown up with the suit and tie, you know, or the, fancy designer outfit or something seeing the little person inside the big one it's almost like you know like one of those robots where there's a little kid inside driving the big robot i see seeing that and but i'm an adult who sometimes i think you know <laughs> what are you doing you've you've published another silly little poem or you've you you're showing this painting to people it's a bunch of splodges on a piece of canvas you know mm-hmm. are you serious but that's me judging myself before others potentially judge me but I do dare I do dare to put my stuff out there that's why it's so important for me to create stuff and put it out there with no excuses I never almost never say when I publish something that it's good or bad I just say this is what I've just done this is what I've just done here's another thing I've just done I want people to see that it's okay to put stuff out there um, and that they don't have to make apologies for it they don't have to prove themselves to anyone i see Uh, and if i am to put it differently let's say what touches you 
What touches your heart the most in the coaching that you do? What really makes your heart vibrate? Again, it goes beyond coaching because coaching is, it's another, sorry, it's another label, but it's still just a couple of people sharing their experience of life with each other. But, but sorry, I have to, I can't help it. But the word label is a label itself, no? All words are labels. <laughs> someone, someone pointed out to me the other day that I was the most judgmental person about judgmental people that they knew. <laughs> <laughs> I was judging them make- for being judgmental. <laughs> you know, I was saying, you know, oh God, look at all these people. They're so judgmental. Why don't they just be, I don't know, more like me? I'm, I'm not judgmental at all. And I just judged them like crazy. So uh, I'm thinking and talking more openly about death these days because I think that inspires us to live our lives more fully um, i'm touched by anything and everything it could be something purely human something someone does or it could be nature you know i'm not going to start crying over a leaf probably but maybe not far from and seeing beauty in everything i think that's why it's a beautiful thing to try and express ourselves creatively because it is what it is you know you could say something's utter nonsense or it's the most profound thing you've ever seen and if you feel that it is then it is your definition is the right definition for you that's why art critics are basically a waste of space or a waste of time you know how can someone else tell you that something is good or bad but i try to tell my show my coaches that i believe this and i do it by telling them that they should never compare themselves to anyone how how can what's the point of that they are not anyone else they're completely unique no one has lived the life they've lived and secondly by showing that i do that i expose myself emotionally every single time i do anything and explicitly publishing a photograph or a poem how a poem is one of the most personal things you can possibly put out there Mm -hmm. because you know in colors and stuff it's kind of a bit abstract but poems are words <laughs> and that's that's getting really personal so though- how would you define the the weight or the importance of the words that you use in a poem as com- as opposed to the words that we use in in like our usual talk how come words in a poem are no longer a label because we all agree that a poem is totally different language yeah it's really interesting poetry is really interesting because it is it, it allows you to get stuff out there in a way you wouldn't be able to get, get out otherwise. You can say it's a poem. So people aren't 100% sure if it's exactly what you're feeling or not. Secondly, you can use all sorts of metaphors and funny language, which obscures the meaning. So you're not saying, you know, I'm feeling really bad, but you can, you know, you could say, I don't know, the leaves are crying today. The trees are crying today. You know, uh, people will get the idea that, Maybe not everything is right in your world, but you haven't said, I feel really shit. Oh, poor me. So it's a poetry transforming. Is it's transforming and, and, and uh, channeling some sort of emotions. Poems come from emotions in your case. Would you say that? Yes. Well, I think everything comes from emotion. Mm. Everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we're pure emotional beings. Sure. The decision to do something had been taken before any rational, um, you know, considerations came in at all. It's when you see, like when you see someone, bam, you have made a whole load of judgments or assumptions about the person before they even open their mouth, before they approach you. So it's all emotion. Okay, yeah, a bit of rational from time to time. Often it's to, to justify the emotion. To justify the decision. That you've already made. <laughs> but um, yeah, but fundamental, even if it's completely rational, you emotionally think you're less likely to be attacked if you make a rational decision. So it's emotion. Everything is emotion. Everything is pure emotion. And so a poem is a really beautiful distillation of that. Distillation. I love that word. Yes. <laughs> and it's also a way for grown ups to express themselves emotionally in a, you know, a non embarrassing way. Although, you know, it's an official way. Poetry is a thing, you know, there are even institutions about it and books on it. So it's a thing. So you're allowed to show your emotion there. And people might even think you're a kind of really sensitive guy. Um, And it's also fun. It's absolutely pure, um, creative, and sometimes intellectual fun. You know, 
it depends what your definition if you have a definition of poetry maybe maybe you do maybe you don't but for me i'm kind of traditionalist in that i like rhymes i've noticed that it's beautiful i love rhymes too although i like uh uh, poems that are how are they called in English? Uh, I don't know, maybe free free poetry, free poetry or something. There are some types of so-called poetry where where there are no rhymes at all. I have no problem. People express themselves as they want to. Obviously, I'm not the poetry police. Um, but personally, mm -hmm. sometimes I look at some modern poems and I think, well, they've just taken a text and they've chopped the line at a certain point and um, called it poetry. And I think, um, yeah, it's not my cup of tea. I love, I love rhyming is such an art. You know, you can rhyme things all over the place. You can, it can be classic, you know, not rhyme, rhyme, not rhyme, rhyme. You can put rhyming words in the text, not at the end of sentences. So you get this kind of echo of a sound. You've got imperfect rhymes where, you know, it's, it's a similar sound, but it's not exactly the same. Um, and that's just rhyming. That's just rhymes are interesting, they're a huge challenge because they have to play two roles. Mm. One is they have to they have to rhyme. <laughs> you have to find two words that rhyme. That's, that's the first challenge. And the second is the meaning they carry has to be right for the poem. So you might have the perfect rhyme, but the meaning isn't right. You know, it, it isn't what you want to say. So it's a, it's a puzzle. You find both the, the words that sound really good together and the meaning they carry is the meaning you want to express. And if you bring them together and you do get that sort of concentration of various pleasing things coming together, then it can be really powerful. That's why it's so powerful. And is there a place to start, like if for people wanting to take classes on poetry, on writing with you? Is there a place to start? How, how, how do you start from not, not writing a poem at all? I mean, to yeah. putting some, some words together. Where do you start? Yeah, well, Give us a hint. That, it may be that people have already written something, but they're keeping it under wraps. In a, in You're a right. Deal, you know? And I might say to them, well, you know, well, do you want to show it to me? Well, you know, why don't, why don't you? It's, it's a lovely balance between not forcing them to, but encouraging them to. And, and letting them realize that I will love anything they've done because they've done it. And if they show it to me, it's an honor. Even if, it, even if it's, I was going to say, even if it's crap, that's a joke. But, you know, even if it's whatever it is, whatever it is, I, it's such an honor when someone shares their creativity with me. It's a real honor. Like you said earlier, they're letting you into their world. Wow, that doesn't have a price on it. Um, so if they haven't, then I say, well, write something, you know, write something, <laughs> write, write a line, write another line. Uh, what's what? What do you like in life? I'm inventing this as I'm speaking, by the way. You know, what do you like in life? You like going for walks. Why do you like going for walks? Well, I like nature. I like the trees. You know, all the flowers. And um, so, write a line about a flower. What do you like about the flower? Is it the color, the smell, the way it looks like a single flower, like a single bright red poppy in a field of golden corn? <laughs> Sounds like a cliche, but you know. But you could, you could equally create that with words, you know, somehow describe a single poppy in a, a yellowish field of corn. That could equally be a, a written image. So poetry could be a written image as well. So you see it, you imagine it, and then you can describe it. That's what you do sometimes. You write texts on your photos. Yeah, Would you consider that poetry or not necessarily? What I've enjoyed, well, to be honest, I call everything I do now sabotry, if you like. And when I, when I coach, I, we had an interesting discussion, actually, a few years ago, on the training course that I did for, for coaching, which I didn't finish, which I'm actually, by the way, in, in brackets, I'm pleased about. Because although a lot of people saw it as a failure, the big F word, you know, and that I was an idiot with a capital I, because I spent all that money, didn't get the certificate, therefore couldn't be an official official coach. I saw, the, saw it as the opposite because it's, it's a story. I tell people, I didn't feel right and I didn't go through with it. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't lose my money because it was a wonderful experience. I learned so much. I didn't lose the certificate that I could have had because I, I now look back on that and I see it as something around my neck, which I didn't, I, I realized I didn't want. But that's, that's, that's an aside. The point is, 
I felt a certain way, which was against what people were expecting, and I followed it anyway. So, um, yeah, so basically on that course, we came up with the, well, maybe I said, I don't do any particular type of coaching. I do sabism. What I do is sabism. And what you do, if you're called Tom, you do Tomism. Mm-hmm. And you, um, you know, Valérie, you do Valérie's, Valérie'sm. So I'm doing Susanism? Well, for me, you are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not interested in what you've studied. Well, I could be, because it might be interesting. Mm-hmm. But fundamentally, I don't want you to do anything other than Susanism, mm-hmm. Susanism. That's what I want. Well, you think you think that it's possible for me to do something else than what I am? I mean, the tools are just the tools. It's just like you using a camera to take photos. If I told you, stop using that camera, I mean, why would you want to use a camera? It's a tool. Just be yourself. You wouldn't be able to take pictures. And of course, yeah. you will always do it out of who you are. And we've seen cases where people are following masters in various paths and various uh, domains of activity, artistic or not. And then eventually they uh, they go beyond what the, the, the teacher taught them because this is our nature to go beyond the teaching. So teaching is good because it gives you a base. You learn, uh, you need to learn the alphabet in order to create a poetry. Without learning the alphabet, you couldn't write it. So this is how I uh, look at the tools, just the basic set of of, uh, elementary knowledge that allows you to be creative with afterwards. So um, I, I agree with all, it, I, I feel the same. Um, and it goes for both tools and for masters or people who are more further along the path than you are. A lot of people get stuck at that level. They get stuck at the tool level, their favorite tool level. And they even attach themselves to that, you know, qualifying <clears throat> in it, getting the master's level, using the net. Fine, fine. But a lot of people, they seem to, I say get stuck. That's a, that's a judgment. But for me, they seem to be stuck because there are so many different tools. It's like religions, you know, it's like, isn't there something, aren't they all trying to get at something further? Aren't they a stepping stone towards, but for me, a true teacher, as exactly as you just said, a true teacher, their, their, their purest form of success would be that the student no longer needs them. And many teachers, they don't want that. They want to stay in the position of being needed. So I love, I love this idea. So that's why I, I'm not such a fan of talking about tools and even, to be honest, using them these days for that reason. On my masterclasses, I incorporate this idea into the structure of the masterclasses. There are five modules. The first, it's one week, the nine weeks. So it's one week is introduction. Mm-hmm. The last week is finishing up and normally having a presenting whatever you've done. Mm-hmm. You've got this. So it's one week, one week, three weeks, two weeks, two weeks. So you kind of go up to the biggest module is the longest, and then you go down oof, I see. to the end. Okay. And in the middle, it's the core competencies. It's the tools. In, in photography and writing, it's the toolbox. This is where you get a ton of really cool tools. The second module, after the introduction, is learning the basics. Yes. But the fourth module, which is actually the final of the three, the three of the basics, the, the toolbox, all the competencies, mm-hmm. all the qualifications you might want. Mm-hmm. And the fourth module, which is actually the final, is, it could be like beginner, intermediate, advanced. The advanced module is where you move beyond tools. For the photographers, it's starting to find your photographer's eye. For the, writer, the writers, it's starting to find your writer's voice. And that can't be taught. It's not possible. I don't know what your writer's voice is. I don't know what your vision of the world is. I haven't lived your life. I, love I haven't that. been in your skin for 50 years. There's a nice um, way I talk about it. And that is that sometimes people look at a photograph of mine. My photographic vision is photographs of Paris. I go out there. Paris offers me images. I try to create something which is halfway between the grim reality of life. Sometimes you take a photograph of a street in Paris. It's just not that pretty. And some sort of fantasy land. So yeah, I play with the images, change the colors, you know, applications, wonderful. You have to start with a great image though, in your mind. You can't use an app to turn a piece of crap into something good. But a lot of people will say, wow, I love that picture. What app did you use? They think you can buy an app that will give you 
a picture like one they like that I did. To cut a long story short, I basically give them an entire rundown of the major events of my life, including all the bad crap and the good things and the ups and the downs and the different, basically, you know, 56 years of life. That's the app you need to have taken that photograph. There's no app. (laughs) If you take a photograph, I could never, ever take that photograph. There's no app because I haven't lived your life, you know. So one click, when you take a photograph, that click is the sum total of your entire life up until then. The same as if you write a word on a piece of paper. Your entire life is there. was leading up to that moment. It's in yeah. that. It's in that photo. Wonderful. And that's powerful. I you know what I just uh, had in mind, like an idea, because indeed you are kind of stimulating creativity when we talk to you. I was thinking to make a, an exposition of the worst photos that one made you know how about that <laughs> what would happen if you did that you know there's what you consider like rate you know like a yeah. failed yeah 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 um that we might find something this is getting interesting sorry there's yes. uh, we're not alone yes oh you have you have a friend oh yes oh yes this is pisa yeah well we were talking about <laughs> the <Some> failure <laughs> And uh, the photos that we might consider a failure, if we look deeply into them, I'm pretty sure we find something in there to recognize. There is some logic or some sense um, in in the mistakes that we make. And there yeah. could be some clues that we can find by looking. And I was talking to you now and thinking, taking all your bad photos and just put them on a wall and look at them and see what it gives, you know, could be yeah. something wonderful. Actually, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I mean, this word "bad" by whose on whose terms? Um, we don't know. If you show a photograph to someone, they don't know if you think it's good or bad. If you personally think it's good or bad, until you tell them. And often, often, I see a lot of people. They they show a piece of a photograph. Let's say they haven't criticized it before they show it. They often do. Yeah. People will say they love it, and they will say, "But I thought it was crap." You know. Well you don't know what people are going to think of your work to be honest for a start it doesn't really matter but secondly you don't know whether they're going to think it's good or bad and some will think it's good and some will think it's bad for personal reasons you know it might yeah. remind someone of something powerful on someone else you know there's you just can't there's no right taste it, it doesn't exist the right taste you know my taste is not only right for me but also for you you know if you don't like the same music as me well actually you're wrong but you know carry on so do you think we have time to to do a little uh, something together or you would you like to read us a poem I let you choose? So like this, I don't impose you my vision on things. Does that mean I have to find you're a free you're a free person? <laughs> yeah, oh, I wasn't ready for that. So maybe I'll have to open my poetry site. Each one means something. Well, I'll tell you so which one I had selected, sure. which yeah, was um, which was lovely for me to read and very touching. It really brought me somewhere. Let me see if I still have it open can you, here. Can you tell me what year it is? Uh, it's 1999. Oh, okay. I had a daughter. Uh, a girl came to live with me in Paris in maybe 1994 or something like that. We had a child together. It didn't work out. She and my daughter went back to the UK, and I visited her regularly. And sometimes when I was – well, this is the story of just – one day that happened and it's called gloves in my pocket she lives in london and i live in paris but i've got her gloves in my pocket two purple mittens for warming her hands chilly no busy daddy to grab i popped them into my pocket i did yes one day when the wind didn't bite one day when the roundabout spun itself dizzy one day when the slide got a fright i smuggled them back to paris i did yes back to the mold and the drab To the grime and the dirt with no baby to hold, I grin as paint peels from a crack. I'll see her again in two days and a half, and I really should give her them back. Those sweet little mitts, favourite colour, you know, given up for some pushes and shoves. I popped them into my pocket, I did, as the swing swung and danced with delight. Now I think of them lining my jacket with dust as I lie here alone in the night. Tossing and churning, I dream of warm winters and tropical hungers and loves. I live in Paris and she lives in London. 
but I've got her gloves in my pocket. And that's a very difficult poem to read. I often cry at my own poems. Uh, like I said, it's therapy. I'm a lot better these days, um, but I had a few problems and poetry really saved me, I would say. That's why I was interested that you are really the first person who actually asked me to talk about poetry, you know, as opposed to, often it's photography, you know, the easy topic, <laughs> it's visual. Let's have a look at some of your photographs. But poetry in a way is deeper. It is. You're exposing yourselves with words, but they're carefully chosen words. Uh, it's dangerous. Yeah. Poetry, it's, it's got a funny reputation, you know, uh, almost sometimes maybe negative, you know, real men don't write poetry or something. And yet it's so powerful. And I got rid of a lot of my, the, I helped um, exteriorize a lot of the pain I had from splitting up with the mother of my child, but more than that, my daughter, you know, I managed a lot of my poems from around that time are, uh, are with her in them. Um, and if you look through my poetry over the years, it's kind of a, not a litany, it's kind of a, a history of bearing my soul of, uh, of various emotional events that I've been through. Having said that, there's something wonderful about dealing with very hard, difficult emotions creatively. I've been in the depths, you know, especially through drinking, the really bad, deep depths, but I still managed to get a poem out. I still managed to somehow express that I was still alive. Deep down there in this mess, somehow I could write a poem about, you know, being horribly controlled by something, you know, I was still able to do it. Poetry saved me, I could say. I can think I can quite safely say that. Poetry saved me. Instead of doing really bad stuff, I would, in the depths, in a bad state, I would sit on a bench somewhere and write a poem. So, uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing this with us and uh, mm. with me here. Yeah. And for opening up your heart and soul, because poem, poetry comes from the soul. It cannot come from elsewhere. And this is why I love poetry and I've always loved it. And I, I've written some poems. I would not say that they were not that good. I would say that they were poems. <laughs> no, okay. Careful. <laughs> Master. Don't forget, don't forget I'm who learning. you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're quite cool, actually, when I read there them. There are no good that, or bad poems. They're quite cool. And uh, as you said, there, there is some... Something happening that takes over. This is how I experience art, if you want, and, and painting and uh, poetry. It's something that takes over. And it is like a, a tune that comes to your mind in, when it comes to poetry. It's been a long time that I didn't write anything, but it comes like a, a, a mood. It comes like a set of words, like a key word. And as you said, you let it there and then you start working with it and I, I, I keep writing and writing until something comes up and then I know when it's done. And I like that, but it's been a while that I didn't write. And uh, my cat really likes being around you. <laughs> She's very sweet. Yeah, I love so, it. It's like, it's like when in you're in a, the deep dark depths, it's like the soul, the soul or life, the life force is saying to you, come on, it's gonna be okay. You can do better than this. Let's, let's get something out there. Maybe it'll even touch someone else. Um, so that's always been the way I've dealt with stuff. And I'm still here. And it's actually quite a, I'm quite surprised I'm still here. But I am. And I think this huge um, current, undercurrent of wanting to create stuff and get stuff out there and share it has, is, is why I'm still here. Why it didn't sink completely. Hey, she's still here too. <laughs> Would you have, would you have one last word to share with our viewers? Uh, we didn't discuss at all about the, the context that we're living in and how you deal with that. But you know, maybe we meet again and we read some poetry together again, uh, if you would like, or with show pleasure. some more more of your photographs and and some other other aspects that we haven't discussed today. I had a. a a million of questions and uh, uh, I didn't get to ask uh, much. Um, but would there be a, 
a few words that you would like to address to those who could be worried uh, today and uh, struggle with fear and anxiety looking at what's happening in the world today. Just a few words. I'm always going back and forth. At one point last year, I think, or this year on the train, I thought I'd discovered what purpose and meaning meant. I didn't, I didn't, I knew, I knew it was, I'd read a lot of articles saying, find your purpose and meaning in life and things would be much better. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and at one point I thought that I'd found a really simple explanation for that. And that was uh, sitting on the train and it suddenly came to me, no purpose is what you like and meaning is what you do. It was a really simple explanation. Mm -hmm. And it was something along the lines of finding what you like doing and do more of it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That isn't right. So I haven't got that right, but I will move on from that. And my latest thing is um, I'm not convinced that there is a purpose at all, or that we need to find one. I, I think we, there's kind of two sides to being human. One is the worst thing that ever happened to us was that we discovered the question, why? Specifically, why are we here? And I think if I find the answer to that, my life will be better. I think that's really bad news discovering that question. But right now I'm thinking I'm not too bothered about having a big purpose in life. I do believe in all we have is the present moment. I do think that it's nice to have objectives because it gives us a, a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling to do something because you think that in the future, this will lead to something else good or it'll make someone else happy. But I do really fundamentally believe in the present moment and enjoying it, not wanting to be elsewhere, trying to move away from the need to find answers to questions that it's only we who have invented them in the first place. If we don't ask questions, we probably won't worry about too much about needing to find the answer. What seems to make sense? It seems to make sense to me to, to enjoy things on a day-to-day -day basis. That's yeah. why I created a Facebook group called Today's the Day. Mm -hmm. I'm not using that as an advert. I'm just saying it, it really sums up what I believe. Each time the sun rises, it's like a mini birth. We've been granted a new day on this earth or this ex in this experience. And we should celebrate that. And days are great because it really is like a mini life. The sun rises and we wake up. Where were we before we woke up? Good question. If we hadn't woken up, would we miss ourselves? <laughs> Weird questions and yet kind of profound. So let's say we wake up every morning. We do wake up every morning until the morning we die. Until we won't. Yeah. So the day you, without getting into, you know, weird stuff about life after death, who knows? Who knows anything? You wake up in the morning. You seem to be here. Uh, I seem to be here. I seem to be me. <laughs> Great. Isn't it nice if we can enjoy the fact that we've woken up every morning? Whatever comes, comes. There's no good or bad. We learn from everything. It's like you talking about mistakes. You learn far more from so-called mistakes than from when things go well. <laughs> yeah. Let's enjoy each day as though it were a mini life. Let's at the end of the day, which is the end of our mini life, this mini life for the day, the sun goes down, the lights go out and we fall asleep. We disappear. And sometimes we wake up the next morning and sometimes we don't. What about if at the end of each day we can say today was the day or today is the day I did this cool thing. And it's up to us to decide what that cool thing is. And it could be giving a kiss to a loved one that you haven't seen for a while, or it could be doing a painting. It could be just smiling uh, at the, the lady in the, in the baker. Uh, it could be anything. But, but if, if we have this accumulating uh, set a series of good days, my idea is, my hope is that when we get to the last day, we probably don't know when the last day is, the, time, when, the day we go to sleep and we don't wake up the next morning. Or if we do know, wouldn't it be great to look back and think, you know, not, not that was a really good day. I'm glad I lived that day, but that was a really good life. I'm really glad I lived that life. But that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think many people don't, don't appreciate their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. I think they go through life almost like they hadn't woken up. And when they get to the last day, they kind of regret that. So in order to realize we're living good lives on a day-to-day -day basis, being grateful for the, you know, we're in luxury here. Talking on the internet is a luxury. Do we, do we appreciate that? 
um, I find that creativity is a great way to do it. I encourage people to create something every day. It could be incredibly simple. It could be you know, anything, anything. It's just something you're pleased with doing. And if it's something you can share with others and they get some pleasure from it, you've touched another human being, which I think is really fundamentally what being alive is about. It's even better. That's That's got to be a good thing, yeah. yeah. Try every day to create something cool which touches someone else. And that's about as good as it gets, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I was watching here, I was looking at one of your uh, photos, Will You See Me Ever Again, with the text that you added on it. Uh, we think questions must have answers and that we should know them. But answers have countless questions. How senseless to solve them. <laughs> Lovely. That's one of my latest, and that is yes. a, in a nutshell where it's where I am now. I don't Wonderful. know where I'll be tomorrow. But. <laughs> Thank you, Sab. And yeah. thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you all for uh, liking and subscribing. And of course, if you have something to say, want to have a conversation here with me and spread your message, clarify what's important to you. Contact me and uh, let's talk. And I'll see you all very soon. Bye.